Even when God gives us discipline or punishment, that is an example of his love. And so these plagues are not just about judgments, but really they're opportunities to repent. We had this ministry attached to our church at one time. It was called Grace House. It was for those who were addicted to, to, to alcohol and drugs and all that. And she said the best thing that ever happened to her was when she got arrested and put in jail. So let's say you love kids, but you go to, to school and your daughter or your child is being picked on. And there's this mean, mean kid. I mean, he is a brat times 10. And, and you tried everything. You went to the principal. You went to the teacher. You've, you've tried to be nice. You've given stuff. You've, you've explored every avenue to get this kid to stop being a bully. But this kid is incorrigible. I mean, he will not listen to anybody and so eventually, because you love your daughter and you don't want to see her continue to go through this, and for the sake of this child, you're not going to let this child continue to do this for all eternity, you're going to step in and put an end to this. Not because you just hate this child and you can't wait to see this child squirm, but because out of love for your child and love for what's best for this child, you step in and judge. And that's what God does. God's heart is for us. So, so, so don't think of like when I read that from Jonathan Edwards, that God is up there like happy, going like, yes, can't wait. Another one's going to hell. Yes. No, his heart breaks. I'll tell you the best way to explain this, and y'all, I pray because the first service did not get this illustration. I pray y'all do. <sighs> okay. Remember in episode three of Star Wars, okay, <laughs> where Obi-Wan Kenobi has brought up Anakin Skywalker, and Anakin Skywalker has turned to the dark side, and now he's evil. He's killed a bunch of young kids, and, and Anakin Skywalker becomes Darth Vader, so y'all, spoiler warning, okay, but he is doing all this evil stuff, and Obi-Wan has to stop him. He's tried to talk to him, to reason to him. He won't listen. So finally, he has to take his lightsaber and cut off his arms and legs and leave him to, 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 to die. But as he's doing it, Obi-Wan is crying. Is, is, his heart is breaking because this is one he loves. But because he has a hard heart and it's not repenting, it's not seeing the error of his ways, he can't let him continue to do the evil he's doing. So the wrath came because the love that he had was refused. So these plagues are not just simply about God socking it to him. It's that Pharaoh's heart was hard and God is going to judge him. But God in his sovereignty will use that judgment for his own purpose and glory. To accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Second thing we need to keep in mind. Our choices to do wrong will impact not just us but everyone around us. And not only that, but because our lives are so intertwined and intermingled, when we are judged, even the judgment impacts other folks. It is Pharaoh's heart that is hard. Pharaoh is the one who is stubborn and won't listen to God. But when Pharaoh is judged, who feels the impact? Not just Pharaoh, but all of Egypt. Because their lives are intertwined. It's kind of like this. At a church I was at, we had this young boy. He was about this big. And he was, I mean, I'd say he was just wonderful. He, he was full of, of, of all kind of stuff. He was smart, but he was chaotic, ADHD. But I'm a wonderful kid. But the problem was he had a father who was kind of, didn't make the best choices in life. And so his dad was in and out of prison. And then finally his dad got back home. Things were great. Dad was home every night. Dad was there each day. Mom didn't have to work two jobs. She was doing great. They had four kids. But then dad decided to start selling drugs again. Dad got busted. Dad got sent to jail. Now the judgment was upon the dad, but guess who felt his judgment? That mom who now had to support those four kids without any help from her husband who was now in jail. Those kids felt it when, when dad was no longer home. 
Did you see how that judgment was impacted, impacted everybody else? And I would say that, that our choice, especially if you're in a leadership position, it all rolls downhill. <laughs> and other people feel that. Third, in many ways, as you go through these plagues, it seems like God is pulling his punches. I mean, God, do y'all remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? God, hellfire, brimstone from the sky, destroy everything. I mean, but yet here, God has 10 plagues. And one of them is like, you know, water to blood, that's it. No drinking water, that stinks. Frogs, that, that's, a, that's a plague. I mean, God pulls his punches. In fact, one of the things in Exodus 9, verse 13, it, sa- it says this. The Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so they may worship me. Or listen to this, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. I mean, God's almost being nice about this. In fact, when it comes time to, for the hail, he tells them, I'm going to give you a day's warning. All your livestock and all that's going to be impacted by this. So this time tomorrow, hail will fall from the sky. Basically saying, hey, if you don't want your, your livestock impacted, pull them in. Guard them. So, so, so when we look at these plagues, I mean, God, he's God. He, he could have done this with just one plague. Boom, it's all done. But he brings 10. Why? Because this is not just about annihilation. This is not just about judgment. God is going to use this for other purposes. And that's the next thing. Remember, all of this started because Moses went to Pharaoh and said, Yahweh says, let my people go. And Pharaoh's response, who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh that I should listen to him? And so all these plagues, notice the response is, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. God is showing them, this is who I am. But it's not just showing Pharaoh. I mean, God God could have easily shown Pharaoh that he was the Lord. I mean, could you imagine if Moses went into Pharaoh's court and says, let my people go. And And Pharaoh says, who is the Lord? And God says, all right, don't believe me? Boom, whole court, everybody's a llama. And a whole courtroom full of llamas. Pharaoh said, whoa, that's pretty impressive. But this isn't just simply about Pharaoh. God wants everybody to know. So he's going to let the Egyptians know. He's going to convince the people. Look look at Exodus 7, verse 4. So my Pharaoh says, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with the mighty acts of judgment. I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of them. Now, we're going to learn more here in a moment how all the plagues matched up with the different deities of Egypt and how it was to prove to the Egyptians their gods were worthless. But he wants the Egyptians to understand, I am the Lord. But not just them, but the the Hebrews himself. Remember, they've been slaves for 400 years. They thought God had forgotten about them. And now you're going to see this is how powerful God is. This is how great God is. And he's going to remind them of that. In fact, so much that he's going to let their kids and kids know. In Exodus 10 verse 1, it says this. The Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these signs of mine among them. And listen to this, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am the Lord. God says, I'm going to do something so great that you'll be telling your kids about this, and your kids will tell their kids about what I've done here. That's how great and awesome this will be. But also, it's about letting the whole world know who God is. Exodus 9, verse 16 says, But I've raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. 
So everybody's going to say, who is the Lord? I am the Lord. How do you know? Look what he did. Look how powerful he is. And so these plagues are not just about judgments, but really they're opportunities to repent, to to confess and to say, Yahweh is the Lord our God. To know him, to seek him. And some did. That's what's so amazing about this. Some of the Egyptians listened and believed in God. Exodus 12, verse 12, excuse me, says, Many other people went up with them, and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. Other people, that's the Egyptians. The Egyptians actually listened and said, You know what? Maybe Pharaoh's not that great. Maybe our gods, our culture ain't the best. Maybe we should follow Yahweh. And, and the, way I, uh, the way I want to explain this is this. Now, y'all, I, I'm gonna, I did this in the first service, but I want to do it again because it hurt my heart so bad. Um, Amy, who y'all don't get to see very much, but Amy does all of our pictures and all the words on the screens. Um, if y'all get a chance, y'all go back out and let her know how disappointed that we are with her. <laughs> because she had never seen Rocky Four. Yeah. Okay, number in Rocky Four, where Sylvester Stallone, Rocky, goes over to the, to the USSR, Soviet Union, and he's fighting Drago. And everybody in the Soviet Union is for Drago, but then all of a sudden, Rocky's got so much heart, and he's just so full of life, and he's just showing so much oomph that all the people in the Soviet Union place, they start chanting, USA, USA, USA. And now Rocky has skinned the Cold War because the people have seen how they were wrong and Rocky was right. Okay? Well, imagine instead of saying USA, that, that the Egyptians are saying, Hebrews, 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 and Rocky is Moses. They're like, wow. So they follow them out of the wilderness. The Egyptians, the most powerful nation in the world, abandoned their place in that society to follow a bunch of slaves out into the desert. Why? Because they were convinced that Yahweh was the Lord. And they knew that through the plagues. So it's important for us to remember that that even when God gives us discipline or punishment, that is an example of his love. Because when you go through these things, oftentimes it'll open your eyes to see things that you normally wouldn't see. For example, we had this ministry attached to to our church at one time. It was called Grace House. And you hear me talk about many times, great ministry. It was for those who were addicted to to, to alcohol and drugs and all that, just strictly for, for women. And so one day we did a Friday Bible study with these girls. And one of the women, we was talking about what changed your life? What was it? And she said the best thing that ever happened to her was when she got arrested and put in jail. She said that she would always get caught and they would smack her on the hand or they would send her off to a, to a rehab house and she would go and, you know, wash, rinse, re, re, uh, repeat. But finally, a judge looked at her and said, you know what? You've been in my courtroom so many times. I'm tired of seeing you. No, I'm throwing the book at you. Boom. And for the first time, she said, wow, there's consequences to what I'm doing. And she hit rock bottom in that jail. And so she said it was only then that her eyes were opened. And that's why God, he disciplines us. He does it because he loves us. I love this. In Hebrews 12, verse 10, it says this. They discipline, meaning our fathers, discipline us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It's because he loves you know, oftentimes it's not until your, your physical reality is messed up that your eyes are open to the spiritual reality. I mean, think, think about this. When was it that the prodigal son came to his senses? Was it when he was with all of his buddies having a great time? Or was it when he was knee deep in pig slop, his heart, I mean, his stomach growling because he was so hungry that he finally came to his senses and said, I need to go back home. 